I don't come from a political family. I didn't think about the possibility of being president of the United States. My mother didn't take me into her arms and tell me that someday you'll be president. My mother was a Quaker, and she was a very devout pacifist, as, as, as a good Quaker should be. My mother was quite well educated for those times. My father uh, only went through the sixth grade, and he worked in every kind of a job. As a matter of fact, he built the house that I was born in. Uh, my father had a small store, and the, my brothers and I had worked in it as we worked before and after school in order to help work our way through school. My mother was uh, one who had no enemies. My father was argumentative, he was combative, he was competitive. From him, I got that arguing ability, but from my mother, uh, more the, the, the dedication to uh, scholarship and an early start. And if it had not been for my mother, it would have been very difficult. My mother recalls that I uh, played by ear, which I did before I ever took any lessons. And I became quite advanced. But I think it really came down to a choice. Would I concentrate on music, or should I move to debating and other areas? And uh, I finally moved in the other direction. Sometimes I, I rather regret it. I remember the headlines, Nixon bugged himself. Taping was done for the purpose of having it for the historical record. It was voice activated. Everything was taped, which of course was probably stupid. There has been a new release of White House audio tapes and documents just out tonight from the Nixon Library in California. Say what you will about him, Richard Nixon is one of the most fascinating figures in American history. Just when we think we know everything there is to know about him, we find out something else. The recordings Richard Nixon intended for his own use continue to tell history, his uncensored story. The problem is that historians are going to grab a, an hour of tape when these tapes come out. And uh, uh, if you listen to a snippet of tape, you're going to form an impression of this man that's going to be wrong. So sometime, hopefully, there will be a historian or a committee of historians who will listen to all the tapes and go into all the archives and then come out and say Richard Nixon was the strangest collection, the strangest paradoxical combination of any man I ever heard of. And they'll be right. Mr. Nixon has always been a solitary figure, protected by only a few trusted associates. Thank you. 
we were obsessed with secrecy. I was uh, almost a basket case with regard to secrecy. We have to recognize that this was wartime. That we were trying to prevent a communist takeover of South Vietnam. I wasn't thinking that much about the tape system that we had. My main concern was ending that war. The Nixon administration said today that it has no intention of permitting a communist military victory in South Vietnam, that the intensified American bombing of North Vietnam is an expression of that determination. I don't know whether you got any report, but the, the strikes yesterday were exceptionally effective. Good. Exceptionally effective. The Pentagon's really jumping up and down. They said it's the best they've ever had in the war. They did it visually, and they just knocked the hell out of stuff. It is said the new bombing of North Vietnam is only temporary, and the policy still is gradually to end the war. Nobody says when, and nobody gives any persuasive reasons why it didn't end long ago. I know everybody wants to end the war. I don't need to hear that, you know. <laughs> and we are ending it. Christ, I know what they think. I don't need to be told. It is hard to remember the time when the American people tended to believe what their government said. I can assure you tonight with confidence that American involvement in this war is coming to an end. The day the South Vietnamese can take over their own defense is in sight. South Vietnam probably never will survive. But can we have a viable war at all if a year from now, two years from now, North Vietnam gobbles up South Vietnam? We can have a viable war. But if it looks as if it's a result of South Vietnamese Congress, we've got to find some formula that holds the thing together in a year or two. Afterwards, after a year, Mr. President, Vietnam will be a backwater. We're veterans of Vietnam and we're telling the American people that the war is wrong. I want to ask you who you're going to believe, the veterans of Vietnam or Tricky Dick? Yeah, it really burns me up. We have no pride to we anymore, Henry. Nobody's going to be pride anymore. Well, That's true about no that. real patriotism. Well, it is true that if you read the polls and everything else, there is a credibility and about us. There's, they don't believe us. They don't. Uh, there's a lack of confidence in the conduct of the war and so forth. If we start, you know, simpering around and catering to these bastards, hell, they, they just eat us alive. Each day to facilitate the process by which the United States washes her hands of Vietnam. Someone has to die so that President Nixon won't be, and these are his words, the first president to lose a war. This fellow Kerry, uh, yeah, hell, he turns out to be uh, uh, really quite a phony. Well, he is sort of a phony, isn't he? I realize in this room there are many reporters who disagree with my policy to bring the war to an end in the way that I believe it should be ended, and who probably agree with the views of the demonstrators. I was insisting on and worked for peace with honor, uh, and they wanted peace at any price. Peace, Nixon, now. Peace, Nixon, now. Richard Nixon was elected to end a war. Peace, Nixon, now. This bloodbath started long ago, and we are a part of it, and it will continue daily as long as the war continues. Despite the fact that many members of Congress were making great noises against the war, and uh, uh, despite the fact that the media was overwhelmingly against the war. That was not the voice of America. The voice of America was the silent majority. Tricia Nixon and Edward Cox will be married tomorrow. The women of my life have all been remarkable. I have always sort of prided myself on self-control, uh, and uh, I am emotional, uh, but I don't believe you should share emotions. I am a great believer in privacy.
Hello. Hi. Hi, Bill. Hey, that was Hi. wedding was just great. It was, uh, the, the you got to give Pat and Trisha the credit. They really worked. And that White House staff, weren't they great? It was absolutely superb. General Hank, sir. Ready. Hello. Yes, sir. Nothing else of interest in the world? Yes, sir. Today? This, uh, goddamn New York Times expose of the most highly classified documents of the war. This is a devastating uh, security breach of, of the greatest magnitude. I was uh, very surprised and shocked. And of course, uh, Henry Kissinger was just as surprised. Uh, Mr. President, I have Dr. Kissinger calling you. What kind of people would do such things? It has the most, it has the highest classification. Yeah, yeah. The thing, though, that Henry, that to me is just unconscionable, this is treasonable action on the part of the bastards that put it out. Thousands of pages of documents, secret documents, from uh, the Pentagon were published in the New York Times, the so-called Pentagon Papers. As a result of their publications, I know that it encouraged the enemy. Publication of parts of the 47-volume top-secret history of American involvement in Vietnam has triggered a major constitutional legal battle over government secrecy and freedom of the press. The Justice Department went to court in New York today and got a temporary order restraining the Times from publishing the next and last two installments. In all probability, it will go all the way to the Supreme Court by midweek or soon. We've got some information we've developed as to where these copies are and who they're likely to uh, have leaked them. And the prime suspect is a gentleman by the name of Ellsberg, who is a left-winger that's now at the Rand Corporation. I felt that as an American citizen, as a responsible citizen, I could no longer cooperate in concealing this information from the American public. He's not Jewish. I'm sure he has Ellsberg. You know somebody that just in it. What's up to the next? Okay. Basic atheist. Well, also an heiress. Heiress. Is that what makes? You know, he puts himself above the law. I want to look at any sense the other areas around where Jews are involved. See, the Jews are all. The Supreme Court said no to the government and yes to the newspapers, voting six to three to let the New York Times and the Washington Post print the rest of the Pentagon Papers. We've got to go gung-ho now on this Ellsberg. You make a martyr out of him when we're going to give an incentive to every little son of a bitch in this government to run out of the place and, and rat on us. Edgar, well, I'd like to check some of the other people around him. That's the others. There's, I think there's a conspiracy involved here. Well, Sheehan of the New York Times is involved. This fellow Jack Anderson here in Washington, that skunk that we have here. Is he in it too? Oh yeah, he's in it. We're up in a conspiracy. They're using any means. We are going to use any means that they're going to get me to come along. Domestically, the most important achievement, without question, were the appointments to the Supreme Court. We left a lot of blood on the floor, but we changed history in the United States. Can you tell us when you may uh, make a uh, nomination or nominations for the Supreme Court? I will make the nominations next week. Both. Both. Mr. President, what? sir, you're going to have a woman on there, aren't you? <laughs> 
I certainly don't rule out a woman. Incidentally, at least two women are under consideration at this time. In preparation for naming two Supreme Court nominees next week, President Nixon has asked the American Bar Association to investigate six potential choices. And the bar has been asked to concentrate first on Judge Mildred Lilly of the California Court of Appeals. Hello. Hello. Yeah, how are you getting along with the woman? Yeah. Did you find out, or do you know that she's Catholic? Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. People, will, yeah. people will see that uh, she's not one of these frigid bitches, you know. That's right, I know, the terrible ones. Yeah. Judge Lilly would be the first woman on the nation's highest court. Originally was appointed to the California bench by then-Governor Earl Warren, later Chief Justice. Well, you said you talked to Chief Justice. And he's not anxious to have a woman on I there, but uh, no more anxious than I am. I don't want them to zero in too much on Lily. So I always handle a woman with a smile. Nobody thinks I'm going to do a woman until this story. Send up a half a dozen more names that you do that, just to keep it confused. And, uh, send down one of those Jewish, uh, send Levy's name in too. Would you do that, please? Get that done right away, okay? Which, uh, which type of names? Oh, I, I don't give a damn who they are. I mean, I mean, some Jews and liberals and so forth, you know. I'm going to have Sacred just deny. So we've got several other names, too, that we're considering. But I, I, I would like to sort of get them off of the woman kick if we can. One dependable White House source strongly indicates the president will produce a surprise candidate, one not cleared by the ABA or mentioned in speculation. I still think that the Rehnquist thing is a damn good possibility. Incidentally, what is Rehnquist? I suppose he's a damn Protestant. I'm sure of that. That's it's too bad. Waspish as waspish can be. Well, that's too damn bad. Tell him to change his religion. <laughs> right. I'll get him baptized this afternoon. Well, baptized and castrated. No, they don't do that. I mean, they circum... No, that's the Jews. Well, anyway, <laughs> whatever he is, get him changed. A special investigating committee of the Bar Association decided last night that neither Friday nor Mrs. Liddy was qualified. Uh, what did you say? Not qualified? Yep. Great. And you know what they said? Great. That she was probably as good as any woman that could be considered by the court. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A statement was made up there. She's the best qualified woman, but she's not qualified for the Supreme Court. Jesus, that's great. That's great. Have you told Renquist yet? Uh, not yet, but I'm sure that he will be more than pleased. Please, Christ, he'll probably drop his teeth. I would expect so. Yeah, I don't want to see him. I think it's not a, I don't think I should. There's no necessity for and I haven't. And I haven't seen Powell. I wouldn't know him if I saw him. Lewis Powell, William Rehnquist, those are names you will remember because they will add distinction and excellence in the highest degree to the Supreme Court of the United States. By design or not, the president has emerged from the controversy as having tried but failed to place a woman on the high court. The ABA's rejection played conveniently into his hands and escaping the much anticipated historic appointment. Let me say that at least we have made a beginning and there will be a woman on the Supreme Court in time. High Lady's job in government today was filled in a conventional way. The president nominated Mrs. Romana Buenuelos to the post of treasurer of the United States. The Ramona Food Company in Gardena, California is owned by Mrs. Romana Buenuelos, President Nixon's nominee to be treasurer of the United States. Yesterday, federal immigration agents raided the company for the sixth time, seeking illegal aliens working in the plant. All I can say is that this company has consistently been found to employ illegal aliens at least six times. John? Yes, sir. The fellow out there in the immigration service is a kike by the name of Rosenberg. He is to be out. He is to be out. I don't give a goddamn what the story is. He went on television. You put him out for going on television, which is a violation. I want you to direct 
the most trusted person you have in the immigration service, that they are to look over all of the activities of the Los Angeles Times, all underlined. We're going after everyone individually, collectively, their income tax. They're starting this week. Every one of those sons of bitches. And they are to send their teams in to see whether they are violating the wetback thing. Now, let me explain, because as a Californian, I know everybody in California hires them. Do it. Give me a report. Very well, sir. John, there's got to be discipline. Hello. The Secretary of the Treasury is just in my office and told me the good news that you were confirmed and unanimously. Oh, Mr. President, thank you very much for calling yeah. me. <laughs> the Mexican-American is not as good as the Mexican. Oh. And you go down into real Mexico and they're clean and they're honest and moral. Moral. They're they all heritage. They're the president time they have heritage. But at the present time they steal. Uh, they're dishonest. They do a lot of other things. They do have they do have some concept, concept of family life at least. They don't live like a bunch of dogs, which the Negroes do live like. We're going to put hard and little Negro badges on welfare rolls at twenty four hundred dollars a family. But I don't believe it. We're, we're, throw them all through those, that's the whole thing. I have greatest compassion for it, but I know they ain't going to make it for 500 years. They are I suppose everyone would like to be remembered particularly for his major achievements. We are here today for the purpose of signing the Cancer Act of 1971. If the cancer initiative, which we began, could save lives, that'd be worth all the rest put together. One subject that uh, Henry brought up was that Reston was in to see him. You're kidding. Yeah, and I want the goddamn staff to understand, and he must not have understood this, that the blackout on the Times is total. Well, he understood it. He stood in your office when we talked about this, and you made the point to him that he was not to see Rustin, that you would right. not see Rustin. That's right. I want you to tell Henry he should not talk to Rustin. I invite the press in because I feel very honored to make this presentation. The president's relations with the press are more restricted and controlled in his behalf than those of any other modern-day president. If you already have one, that makes two. Thank you. Well, we just give you a little trinket. Mr. Goldfinger. Yeah. You must keep up the attack on the media. You've got to keep destroying their credibility. There's not a good one on the whole goddamn free network. No. Not one. Reasoner's bad. The whole damn bunch. Chancellor's bad. Yep. yep. Cronkite's bad. Brather's bad. Oh, Jesus. It's awful. A Severide. The oh, Daniel Shore. Oh, it's terrible. Daniel Shore is a correspondent for CBS News in Washington who is, like many reporters, occasionally at odds with the White House. It was disclosed today that the White House ordered an FBI investigation of Shore just after he had written the story unflattering to the president. You get the ball out of Stan Shore, he's a host. He is always creating something, isn't he? He incidentally is on, you don't, shouldn't get involved in us, but he's on our tax list. Good. They're, uh, good. They're going after a couple of media people and just want to harass them, just get them all the trouble. Exactly. To a great many citizens of this country, it is no longer an honorable thing to be a news broadcaster. The administration has set the country against us, apparently by some design. Because if you can discredit the press, then it doesn't matter much more what they say. Mr. President, as you enter this election year, public opinion polls have indicated that the American people, about 50%, said that you lacked personal warmth and compassion. Why do you suppose that is? Without trying to psychoanalyze myself, because that's your job, uh, I would simply answer the question by saying that uh, my strong point is not rhetoric. It isn't showmanship. Uh, it isn't big promises. My strong point, if I have a strong point, is performance. Rather is just a son of a bitch, don't you think? He's gonna always be a son of a bitch. He's just a bastard, period. Be sure Rather gets a few nasty notes on this reporting. I, I don't know whether it helps or not. Yes, it does. He? Yeah, he's very sensitive to that.
Uh, well, have you have you arranged that? Yes, sir. And uh, I'd hit him hard. I have a temper. I control it publicly rather well. He's a very complicated man. His confidence results from an intellectual analysis of himself in relation to all the factors of his life. This explains his ability to make quick accommodations and dramatic changes in his policies, which is good, but it also explains the sometime periods of brooding retreat and dissociation, when the image of self apparently becomes an image of a strong man beleaguered by fools. Most of our media friends just can't resist uh, psychoanalyzing because uh, they think I'm a very complex and therefore interesting person. Vital to the president's hopes for re-election are the events now taking place in Vietnam. General Haig, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I wanted to ask you, how about that uh, B-3 uh, strike? Is it going to get off, or do we hear yet? Or yes, what? sir. As of now, it's on schedule, and the weather's favorable, and that would be the only thing that would uh, stop it. Right. Be postponed. That would be starting tonight, then. Yes, sir. Or, or today. Clock, aren't I? We have as our special guests tonight the very famous uh, choral group, the Ray Khan of Singers. And if the music is square, it's because I like it square. <laughs> President Nixon. Stop bombing human beings, animals, and vegetation. You go to church on Sundays and pray to Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ were here tonight, you would not dare drop another bomb. Bless the Berrigans and bless Daniel Ellsberg. the goddamnedest thing you ever saw. You know what gave her away, John, when she said, "Free, uh, God bless Ellsberg, because well, I knew that she was one of these uh, completely way out, probably communist. Uh, but uh, I don't think it was an accident. I think it was a plan. I, I suppose the uh, Secret Service found out whether that's the case or not. <laughs> they have to be very careful to be sure that it doesn't be like we're persecuting the bitch. Without secrecy, we would not have had the opening to China. On the visit to China, the press will be limited. We will select the press. That's the one condition. We have to select the press. And it will be the three networks, the two wires, and one cool man for the specials. One. That's all we're going to take. I think you understand? All we're going to play this way. We screw the New York Times. It was gloomy and cold, with snow threatening, but an Arctic blizzard couldn't have dampened President Nixon's high spirits on this morning, as, shunning a top coat, he said goodbye to the notables who had come to see him off to China. China was an unknown land. I'd read about it all my life. Uh, it was a land of mystery, and the fact that we hadn't had communication with it for 25 years uh, builds up that mystery. Gerald worked for you, you worked for him. Uh, we are all equal workers in America. Uh, ABC. Mr. Reisner. How are you, Mr. Gerald? NBC, Mr. Uh, Keplo. National Broadcast. CBS, they only have a camera. Uh, 
A year ago, the possibility that we'd ever see anything like this picture seemed more remote than Neil Armstrong's first footstep on the moon. Mr. Nixon deserves credit for a master stroke that is both opportune and statesmanlike. We knew that we were at a watershed event in human history. If it had not been undertaken, and if China had been forced back under the Soviet umbrella, the geopolitical relationship and balance in the world would be almost hopelessly against us at this time. The question of what city gets the gift panda bears from mainland China has been settled. President and Mrs. Nixon decided today they should be displayed in the Washington Zoo. Just checking to see how the panda thing went. I've been in a meeting and so I was Oh, able to they check. were just darling. Yeah, uh, today. Uh, they raved about them. And, uh, how, did it, how did it work? Were you able to get up to them? Do you pet them or anything like that? Or they don't allow that? Or how does no, it work? No, they're glass cage. Yeah. Did they get a good picture of it, I hope? Oh, it was well covered. Yeah, good, good. She was called Plastic Pat because she was my wife. The people that give that kind of image are basically the women reporters. And, you know, we talk about men reporters, but the women reporters are more bitchy than the men. You're very hard on female reporters, Mr. President. Oh, I'm but hard on all reporters, but only in a friendly way. I would like to broaden the subject, Mr. President. Uh, there are the problems of drugs, of disaffection with the war, of a general alienation. What do you see as the greatest problem facing the American family today? Well, you put your finger, of course, on two problems, but I think they tend to be more symptoms and causes. I think the fundamental cause must be a sense of insecurity, uh, a sense of insecurity that comes from the old values uh, being torn away. Homosexuality, no. Uh, immorality, general. These are the enemies of strong societies. God damn it, we have got to stand up to these people. I do not mind the homosexuality, I understand. Nevertheless, The United States is assembling one of the largest naval strike forces in the history of the war off the Vietnamese coast. Have you carried out the order that I gave last night, 12 hours ago, with regard to using naval gunfire on the road above the DMZ in North Vietnam? Yes, sir. I get all the cruisers and destroyers in the 7th Fleet in that area and get in there as fast as you can. Yes, sir. Officials say the president will not withdraw American air power until he gets a deal he likes. Mr. Mitchell, sir. I can tell you that I'll keep the goddamn thing on and lose the election if necessary, but boy, right after the election, we'll, we'll just level Hanoi. I mean level it. We've got to be thinking in terms of an all-out bombing attack. Now, by an all-out bombing attack, I am thinking of things that go far beyond. I'm thinking of dikes. I'm thinking of natural railroad. I'm thinking, of course, the docks. Within the past week, there have been reports of eyewitnesses claiming to have seen American uh, planes hit dikes and dams. And the question is, has such bombing occurred? Mr. Rather, we have had orders out not to hit dikes because the result in terms of civilian casualties would be extraordinary. American jets and destroyers got the green light today and struck back with a vengeance against targets in North Vietnam. The principal enemy the past few days has been the weather. It is miserable. Mr. Kissinger. Wonder if you'd had any report on the weather. Goddamn bastards can't go. Look at these goddamn Air Force guys. Yeah. 
We know that thousands of soldiers of North and South Vietnam and tens of thousands of innocent men and women and children will die in Indochina in 1972 for the simple reason that President Nixon will not allow the Saigon government to falter until he is secure at home for another term of office. I'm just surprised they could get at that, get at Kennedy though, and for, for me, that's son of a bitch, Jesus Christ. He really is, uh, there is a, there is a man totally without, uh, that's right, scruples. Okay. He's got smart little kikes working for him. Well, they've been, they've been pumping him up. Teddy is a typical Irish extrovert politician, but Jack was more withdrawn and more private. The thing I remember about Kennedy more than anything else was, uh, when we debated, I sensed that he was very shy, uh, frankly, as I was. Let me see the tight shot on count of one, please. Let me see one wider than that. Thank you. Uh, Make a better shave. I resisted the attempt of my own advisors to have the lighting tests, the makeup tests, and so forth that they wanted before the debate. That was a mistake. It's the picture that counts far more than what the candidate says when television is concerned. If the present trend continues, if Mr. Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, will be the next president of the United States. It's the Kennedy mystique. It's still there. It's going to last as long as one of them's living. Kennedy has written, asking for Secret Service protection. He gets more threatening mail than any other public figure. Or do you understand what the problem is? If the son of a bitch gets shot, they say we didn't furnish it. Somebody who's buying insurance and after the election, he said it's been a goddamn thing if you get a chance to damn it. President Nixon's Air Force One touched down at Moscow's Vinukova Airport and rolled up to the isolated VIP reception building at a remote side of the field. The 
president, in his toast, indirectly chided the Russians for helping North Vietnam. But his major point, it seemed, was that great powers have great responsibility. Great power goes great responsibility. I thought it was vitally important in my presidency to make some move toward negotiation rather than confrontation with the Russians. I would hope that a hundred years from now that uh, the world would be a safer place. We were negotiating an arms control agreement. We were trying to end the war in Vietnam. And I decided, well, this is one time I'm not going to get involved in the campaign. I'm going to delegate it all. That was a mistake. There's no excuse for what happened. Five men were arrested early Saturday while trying to install eavesdropping equipment at the Democratic National Committee. And it turns out that one of them has an office in the headquarters of the Committee for the Re-Election of the President. White House consultant was implicated today in that apparent attempt to bug or burglarize or do something to the offices of the Democratic National Committee. The aide is Howard E. Hunt. Just before 3 o'clock this morning in Miami Beach, the Democrats' nominee was George McGovern, the unconventional senator from South Dakota. Never underestimate the power of Richard Nixon to bring harmony to Democratic ranks. accepted your nomination for President of the United States. Tonight, I again proudly accept your nomination for President of the United States. A federal grand jury has returned the first indictments in the Watergate bugging case shall under no circumstances abandon our POWs and our MIAs wherever they are.
Listen, I'll tell you, it makes me ashamed of the people I come from. I'm from that group. Lawyers, business people, so-called superior educations. There is a snobbish elite, you know, by the hate of my guts. Mainly, it is this. I got one of them. And they know it. The White House said today, peace is at hand in Vietnam. <clears throat> we believe that peace is at hand. I think, Mr. President, we can accept practically everything in their proposal. As I look at the entire history out there, South Vietnam probably never been survived. In that very you've got to be, you also have to realize that winning an election is terribly important. It's terribly important this year. If we settle it, say, this October by January 74, no one will give it that. The president said today that he will not allow the American election to influence his policy with bombing North Vietnam. Well, they've really come along on damn near everything we've asked for. Well, it's a really an acceptance of your proposal. Now, I think what we have to do is to try to, if we can keep the lid on, if we can keep the dialogue going past the election. The Nixon campaign rolled through the wealthy northern suburbs of New York City. was just up when the Nixons arrived at their polling place, the Concordia Elementary School in San Clemente. Three hours later, the White House entourage boarded their plane for the flight back to Washington. President Nixon appears to have won re-election by the largest absolute majority ever in American history. You can see the dimensions of Mr. Nixon's landslide tonight. President Nixon with 63%. It's a stunning performance. I simply want to say from the bottom of my heart, thanks for making our last campaign the very best one of all. Thank you. <laughs> Henry Kissinger, when he said peace is at hand before the election, uh, the North Vietnamese said, well, now they have to have peace. And so they got more intransigent as a result. Yes, Mr. President. Anything new? Uh, yes, sir, I've finally gotten uh, Henry's message. Right. And what Henry did, he just broke off in Paris. He said, I will not meet or discuss with you anymore. He's also uh, got a, a military plan, which is sort of gradual. Uh, no, no, no. I will not accept graduality. Right, sir. I, don't I will not accept it. The White House today strongly denied speculation that President Nixon and Henry Kissinger disagree on Vietnam negotiating policy. White House spokesman Ron Ziegler said such reports are totally untrue. If you put yourself in Henry Kissinger's shoes, uh, he is going to spend a good part of the remainder of his life justifying why peace was at hand, but then it wasn't later at hand. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think there's any question where that damn the article came from. Reston is known as the dean of the of the establishment journalist, and he calls Henry, and Henry takes the call. And Can't be really checked to see uh, your check to White House operators. I... Our gals here don't keep any records. Uh, except well, they're out there, somebody who keeps Henry's records. God damn it, we've got to know the record of a call. From now on, let's have the... From now on, I want a record of every one of his calls. Let's have that. I do it in the most discreet way possible. Time magazine said the administration ordered the FBI to tap the phones of both reporters and White House staff members in an attempt to prevent news leaks. Yesterday, that just knocks the bejesus of it. Happy. 
Reporters for the Washington Post were not invited to cover three White House parties given this weekend. Press Secretary Ronald Ziegler denies that there is any vendetta against the paper. No reporter from the Washington Post is ever to be in the White House. Is that clear? Absolutely. No reporter from the Washington Post is ever to be in the White House again, and no photographer either. No photographer, is that clear? Yes, sir. None ever to be in. Now, that is a total order. The most difficult military decision of my whole presidency was the so-called Christmas bombing of 1972. I decided it was time to get it over with. We're going to say we're doing this because they won't return our prisoner before Christmas. That's right. That's right. They were supposed to do it. They wouldn't agree. And we're going to bond and we get those prisoners back. President Nixon today took off the kid gloves and once again flexed America's air muscle. I was convinced that it would break the deadlock in the negotiations. Henry Kissinger agreed that that was the case. Mr. President, I just wanted to tell you that the third wave of B-52s got out and no, no planes shot down. Good. So, uh, did they hear anything? The uh, well, Radio Hanoi has been off the air for 10 hours. All right. And that is bound to create havoc up there. The administration contends that the raids are not terror bombing. The shift to the larger B-52s would seem to indicate that the raids have been designed for psychological as well as military gain. It's a cold season. The American people need some explanation of why it is we're continuing to bomb mm -hmm. and that it isn't simply an exercise in trying to uh, decimate a country. It's too damn bad we aren't decimating the country. Tomorrow, Richard Nixon will drive up Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol. He will place one hand on a Bible, raise the other, and be sworn in again as President of the United States, a very powerful president. Richard Nixon, do something An inauguration is a celebration of our whole process as much as it is a celebration for a partisan victory. In some men, self-confidence and an ease with life seem to come with the suit. In others of us, it is a more fragile, conscious thing. And Mr. Nixon is very much of this group. So we wish this intelligent and complex president the very best, for all our sakes. I thought you'd like to know and uh, tell the girls that we uh, Kissinger's on his way back and we got the agreement. Oh, great. So, uh, oh, you tell isn't them. that marvelous? Okay. It's wonderful. Okay. Yeah, good. Bye. Dr. Kissinger arrived at Andrews Air Force Base outside Washington in the early evening. He was carrying with him a ceasefire agreement initialed in Paris. Now, uh, do you think we should have a picture with you and Henry tonight when he arrives back? I don't think so. I think, uh, I don't think we so. don't want to we don't want to build the Henry thing up all that much. I don't think we should have a picture. No. We today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. That uh, that had to be not only the greatest experience as president, but also th I think of all my public life. January 23, 1973. The agreement on ending the war. We finally have achieved a peace with honor. I know it gags some of you to write that phrase, but that is true. I think there's some guys over there doing a little gagging this morning. <laughs> oh, yeah, when I said this, uh, yeah. this is going to gag you to write peace with honor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it was done. There was no Watergate thing even mentioned, you know? What the hell? Why do people want to write about subject B? They want right. to write about subject A. The president said that no one presently employed in the government was connected with the Watergate bugging case. That would certainly include you. I don't know anything about the uh, the Watergate incident. <laughs> Goddamn Watergate. <laughs>
could be many people involved. Oh, sure. Now, there's that whole story is going to come out. We have a cancer within close to the presidency that's growing. And it basically is because, one, we're being blackmailed. Two, uh, people are going to start perjuring themselves very quickly. It'll cost money. It's dangerous. Nobody, I think people around here are not pros. It's a limit. So the mafia people can do. Right. It's a tough thing to know how to do. That's funny. I would say these people are going to cost a uh, million dollars over the next uh, two years. You can get a million dollars and you can get it in cash. I, I know where it can be got. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not easy, but it can be done. President Nixon and his counsel, John Dean, now appear to be at odds over the Watergate scandal. Miss Julie's calling. Hello? Hello. Daddy? Hi, Julie. I just want you to hear something cheery. We've got the new music uh, machine up in the solarium. It has a TV, and on top of the TV is a record player, and on top of that, a tape cassette. Yeah. It's fabulous. Great, Julie. You really? really enjoy that up there. Yeah, that's a great city. Okay, bye. There is evidence that the president's chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, was involved along with John Ehrlichman of the White House. Look, if we went in and fired the whole White House staff, that's going to satisfy these goddamn cannibals. Based on the actor, who are they after? Hell, they are after Haldeman or Ehrlichman or Dean after me. The president, they need my guts. There really wasn't a happy time in the White House after April 30th, when Haldeman and Erdman left. The resignations came from men so closely associated with Mr. Nixon, they hit almost with the impact of a resignation from the chief executive himself. Today, in one of the most difficult decisions of my presidency, I accepted the resignations of two of my closest associates in the White House, Bob Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, Two of the finest public servants it has been my privilege to know. Well, it's a tough thing, Bob, for you, for John, the rest, but God damn it, I'm never going to discuss this son of a pitching Watergate thing again. Never, 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 never. But let me say, you're a strong man, God damn it, and I love you. <laughs> and I, you know, I love John. God bless you, boy. God okay. bless you. I love you, you as you know. Okay. But my brother. The president has asked me to announce that he has today requested and accepted the resignation of John Dean from his position of the White House counsel. Well, don't you get discouraged. You, Mr. President, I'm not discouraged. You do your job. You, two or three of us have got to stick around, try to hold the goddamn fort. And you, you have saved this country, Mr. President. The history books will show that when they don't, when no one will know what Watergate means. FBI agents were sent into the White House today, normally the preserve of the Secret Service, to stand guard over the papers of H.R. Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, and John Dean. No one can remember the FBI being used that way before. Mr. President, yeah. this would protect those papers so they could not be removed. All files, any, any, any correspondence or anything that has to do with, between me and any member of my staff belongs to the President, not to them. It's not their files, goddammit, they're mine. So I'm not going to have these men treated like criminals, or goddammit, I'll fire this whole fucking staff. You understand that? The Pulitzer Prize Committee today awarded its Distinguished Public Service Prize to the Washington Post for its coverage of the Watergate scandal. Post reporters Carl Bernstein and Robert Woodward were also singled out in the citation for their dominant role in the inquiry. But the truth, so help me God. So help me God. John Dean, the ex-White House counsel, testified today that President Nixon knew about the Watergate cover-up. 
Dean read through a 245-page statement, a president too easily upset by anti-war demonstrators, wiretapping of newsmen, a proposal to firebomb and burglarize the Brookings Institution, spying on Senator Kennedy and other Democrats, efforts to involve the CIA in the cover-up, Haldeman Ehrlichman orders to set up a payoff fund, perjury plans, a fictitious Dean investigation. Coming right down to it, Al, when you look at it, you know, and all this crap we're taking, wouldn't it really be better for the country, you know, to just check out and, uh, and, and no, no, seriously, I don't, I, don't, I mean that, and uh, because uh, I, you see, I'm not at my best. I've got to be at my best, and that means fighting this damn battle, fighting it all out. There was a surprise witness at the Watergate hearings today, and he made a dramatic disclosure. Are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. Alexander Butterfield, former aide to H.R. Haldeman, said that President Nixon ordered secret electronic listening devices installed in his offices and on his telephones. But so far as you know, all telephone calls were also recorded. From the president's office telephone yes. on his desk in the Oval Office yes. and his regular office phone in the executive office building and the desk telephone in his study at Camp David and his telephone in the Lincoln sitting room, those four phones. The White House today confirmed that the president no longer secretly records conversations. The Deputy News Secretary Gerald Warren said, quote, the system has been deactivated. When asked why, he answered, quote, the system has been compromised. The Secret Service says it guards the Nixon tapes, but the tapes are in the control and custody of the White House. The pressure is on the president to produce those tapes or run the grave risk that public opinion will decide he can't because of what is on them. The White House made it clear today that President Nixon has decided not to release tapes of his conversations to the Senate Watergate Committee. Let others wallow in Watergate. We're going to do our job. The president then has drawn a firm line, a line around the White House. He will not release the tape recordings, not even under threat of subpoena. That set the stage for what may well be the biggest constitutional confrontation in our history. There may be some time before the Supreme Court makes the final decision. If I were to make public these tapes, containing as they do blunt and candid remarks on many different subjects, the confidentiality of the office of the president would always be suspect from now on. The president has fired the special Watergate prosecutor, Archibald Cox, and the attorney general has resigned. Elliot Richardson has quit, saying he cannot carry out Mr. Nixon's instructions. The president knew he faced a movement toward impeachment by some members of the House of Representatives. What is it about the television coverage of you in these past weeks and months that has so aroused your anger. Don't get the impression that you arouse my anger. <laughs> you see, I have that impression. <laughs> you see, one can only be angry with those he respects. About nine o'clock, I woke up, I called the office and asked Al Haig how things were going. This is really the first time in this whole period that he sounded really down. He said, well, not good. He said, the Supreme Court has just come down with a decision. When the decision came, it came with maximum impact. One decision, unanimous, delivered by the Chief Justice Warren Burger. President Nixon has not yet responded to the sledgehammer decision of the Supreme Court today, which ruled that he must immediately turn over tapes of 64 presidential conversations. I said to, uh, to General Haig that, uh, uh, that I would uh, resign, but uh, it would be with dignity and with no rancor. And then I thought a minute and I said, well, Al, I really screwed it up, didn't I? 
he didn't have to answer. This momentous, tragic, sad evening because it looks as though President Nixon is going to resign tonight. Mr. Nixon at this hour is at the White House preparing for a talk he will give on television later this evening. I don't know how I got myself together, but I did. Have you got an extra camera in case the lights go out? I'm just kidding. <clears throat> Let me see that you get these lights properly. Uh, yes, I, my eyes always have. You'll find if you get past 60, that's enough. You've taken your picture. Didn't, didn't you take one just now? That's it. Good evening. This is the 37th time I have spoken to you from this office. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. May God's grace be with you in all the days ahead. What is history going to say? How is it going to judge Richard Nixon? On China, on Russia, on Vietnam, the Supreme Court, these things all made a difference. I initiated programs in the field of the environment and hunger and cancer and drugs that I think are very sound building blocks for the future. These are positive achievements. Yes, there was Watergate, the first president ever to resign the office. That's part of history. Always remember, Others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. I think perhaps the, the best description of how I felt then was uh, of a little couplet that read, I am hurt, but I am not slain. I shall lay me down and bleed a while, and I shall rise and fight again. That's the story of my life.